So post-activism is the intelligence of the Afro scene. It's an invitation to navigate the world differently. It's it's Guattari, Felix Guattari, the psychologist saying, bring something incomprehensible into the world. That is post-activism. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. In his conversations with visionaries, innovators, artists, and healers, Thomas invites guests into a relational experience that allows inspiration and innovation to emerge. This is The Point of Relation. guest for today's episode is Bayo Okomolafe. Bayo Okomolafe, rooted with the Yoruba people in a more than human world, is a widely celebrated international speaker, post-humanist thinker, poet, teacher, public intellectual, essayist, and author. He is the founder of the Emergence Network and host of the online post-activist course, We Will Dance with Mountains. We hope you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to the point of relation. I'm Thomas Hubel, and I'm very delighted and happy to sit here with you, Bio. I am so, so much warm welcoming you here into this space and into our relation. And, and I'm curious and I'm deeply interested in some things. So, uh, warm welcome. Thank you for having me, brother. Mm, so good. Uh, we, we just had recently a conversation for one of uh, our courses, and then I thought, no, we need to deepen our conversation. There's so much here, and I want to unpack some of the things much deeper than we could do there. Yeah. And, um, and the first is, like, I want to hear what, what's the most, the, what's your uh, learning edge right now? What are you working on? What what grasps your attention the most at the moment? So where do you feel is your becoming right now active? Mm. I just had an interview uh, with someone around the concept of soft life. And it's this, dare I call it, post-pandemic phenomenon of people responding to work culture, capitalist arrangements in new ways that might be threatening to the captains of industry, to the status quo. Um, so you might understand soft life in consonance with other uh, concepts, other matters afoot, like the great resignation, you know, uh, such things, the lazy movement, I think in China or the lying down movement, I think. I think there's a lazy movement too. But these things, it seems, are expressions of a different alien form of life. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to dance with this. I have a concept, a name for this. I call it the paraterranean. That is the subterranean that sidles the public. It's on the side of the terrain if you will, it's it sidles the public. And I'm thinking this notion of parallax and the paraterranean and the subterranean through the um, historical limitations of therapy and, mm -hmm. and the way therapy is often, um, often polices the, a colleague of mine said, um, psych psychology is the policeman of capitalism. Um, and, and I'm dwelling with that a little bit. This, this idea of policing the individual and how we are in such times that the world is kicking back against the notion of the individual as a separate ontology, as uh -huh. a neat um, uh, pre-individual, I mean, not pre-individual, pre-relational concept. So I'm trying to read what you might think of as Simon Don's trans-individuation with the paraterranean and 
live with my autistic son uh -huh. who calls me into question and in everything I do all the time, who has soft moments that, that breaks apart my, my quests for mastery, who in his, when he has a moment, big feelings, I'm not going to use the word meltdown, when he has big feelings like he had twice today, it disrupts time and space. Mm -hmm. And I find myself sometimes wondering if I'm a hypocrite, if I should be speaking in public at all. And I don't know what to do. And all I can do is hold him. And sometimes I don't even know how to hold him. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is, this is the hard work. Oh, and it's so touching, Maya. It's so touching to hear you. Oh, there's so much uh, vulnerability and honesty in what you shared just now. It touched me deeply you know, to hear about your son because I think parenting is such a such a deep and important yeah. learning process for all of us. And uh, it really touched me as also as a parent when I hear you being with your son. Yeah. yeah. Is there, uh, is, if it's okay for you, uh, then I would love to, to ask you something about this. When you, in the journey with your son, what, what do you feel um, emerged for you? Like two, three things that you feel emerged as your own learning, where you felt that as a father, you, your own, I don't know, universe got bigger uh, through... Yeah what you just shared because it's so deep i think the first fruit of a response feels like saying that um we never really father or mother our children it's generations that do that right it's it's in it's it's an assemblage that does that so that the very concept of a good parent is called into question by the fact that we're not singularly ourselves we're constantly diasporic and ecstatic my mother is fathering my child through me my father is fathering you know right. my child through me and their fathers and mothers and and villages are here at this moment i still find the need to want to control the outcomes to wrestle with possibilities to say, maybe if I controlled for this condition or this variable or that variable, this might evolve or this might emerge. But the thing with him is, and I think this is the very heart, the spirit of the prophetic. The prophetic is not to me predicting what is yet to come. The prophetic is a reconfiguration of space-time and bodies in new ways that might be confusing and might be very debilitating. And yet it's how novelty appears. But when my son has these moments, when I want to tag a reason to why he's crying, like, why are you crying? And he refuses to give an answer because there is no answer. There's no reason behind his crying. Mm. We were playing a while ago and we're playing with joy and rolling into each other and jumping and hitting pillows and all of that. I made certain I'm constantly aware of how much he's vulnerable to hitting his head up somewhere or that. And yet he just burst into tears. It's like modeling the, uh, blurring the divides between extreme joy and grief from happiness. He just started crying and he couldn't control himself. Mm -hmm. And I just held him and said, I don't know why you're crying, but we'll just be here together. Mm -hmm. So it's like his tears summon the indeterminacy of my own edges. It's like I can no longer be a good father, which was always my goal. 
beyond public speaking, beyond public scholarship, beyond writing books and speaking to people across the planet, if there was one thing I wanted more than any other thing is to be a good father to my children. And he calls that into question as if reminding me to let go of the goal, to hold it lightly and yet hold him as he holds me. Mm. And maybe that exceeds being good. Very beautiful. It's very touching like, to listen to you. And um, now that, uh, as you told me just before, that you're in Hamburg, you how, how long are you? And you're staying in the fellowship, I guess, in, in Hamburg. Do you want to share a bit? Or yeah. Is there is a family. You came with your... As your yes, own. my whole family. It's a big house. It's a beautiful place. Um, the new institute, it's called... It's by my friend, founded by a friend, Irk Rickmas, was a politician. And together with Marcus Gabriel, who is another friend of mine, philosopher, invited me and my family to come uh -huh. just to do stuff, <laughs> right? Like um, just spend some time away from our usual um, residents in India and just be here together. So we're here for a couple of months. I'm writing my book, traveling from here. This is our base for now for a couple of months. So uh -huh. it's a good time. It's a beautiful end of a, it's a beautiful um, attempt, tentative attempt to convene people interested in speaking about um, the world's issues there's still something, of course, barely enlightenment about it. it, it you know, the the idea uh, that I can get wise uh, men together and in uh, a room, they could divine solutions. Um, but it's aware of its own limitations and doing things around that. So um, there are beautiful people here from around the world, uh, professors from Yale and other places and it's good to oh, have wow. conversations with them oh, yeah beautiful. about 30 beautiful. people um yeah and the transition is easy for you, you and your family to come to oh, it wasn't it, it well well in in many respects it was because we were so warmly and beautifully received here um it's a beautiful place we have over here and um there's a there's a lot of spirit and friendship and hospitality and generosity so it's yeah. it, but but again this is what i'm reminded by you know you, you you know that um that the familiar idea let me call it the elon muskian idea that one can transplant for instance the human species from earth to Mars, you know, we can just go to Mars. You know, there's right. something very, it presumes that the human is this, like I said, pre-relational, separate right. and separable entity. Right. And I can just move you from point A to point B. Um, but to notice that we are ecosystems, you know, right. means that we cannot just move things you from A to B. Instead, we we are not just moving from here to there. We're calling here to and there into question. We are modifying what here and there means. Because if we were to, this present modern civilization should move to Mars, for instance, we would make Mars Earth, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> right, right, right. We would have to modify it to make it Earth. We would bring our microbes, we will bring our supplements, we will bring our concepts, we will bring our technologies, we will bring our astronaut suits, we will make it Earth, right? So um, it's the same way moving to Hamburg, to a lesser degree, of course, um, meant we had to come with our ecosystem, um, especially Kea's, my son. We had to bring the systems that would support his gut, because he's a sensitive eater and he doesn't eat everything ar around him. Uh -huh. So we had to, some of the difficulties around that were considerable, but we're glad we're here. 
Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you for sharing this because I was wondering how is the transition and also if you live globally, <laughs> how you move uh, as a family. Yeah. I want to tell you that it's, for me, it's always like also in the other conversations we had, um, it's, it's very beautiful to enter the flow of your words. I feel that like there's a blessing in the liquidity or the fluidity of your speaking. It's so, and it's kind of enchanting. It's beautiful. So that's a, a very rare quality. I think you you have. It's beautiful. When you in the, are you writing a book? I guess at the, your next book. You yes. you want to speak a little bit. What's what's up for you? Well, I'm excited about this one. Well, it's two books I'm writing. Just to be <laughs> the, the, the 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 one I'm focusing on um, and giving a lot more time to is called a pedagogy of the cracks, a pedagogy of the cracks, and it it's it come it brings together, and it's it's I'm writing this with a dear younger brother, but beautifully wise soul. His name is Jordi Rosales. He works um, with me in curating courses and doing beautiful things around the world. And I'm so blessed that I have his wisdom alongside um, the things that were, um, will be coming out through the book. But the book is um, an attempt to retell the story of our times. Um, I think to a for, for conversational purposes, I'll say to a dangerous degree, we have depended almost entirely on the narrative of the Anthropocene as a galvanizing planetary cautionary tale, right? That says, this is what's going wrong with climate, with trauma, with racialization, and the thing is to fix it. And I don't think that story as emblematic and as needful useful to many degrees it is, I don't think it does a good job at dismantling and composting the human or noticing the inheritances of this thing we call the human, the burdens, the prestige, the um, elided histories of the thing we call the human. And I think it screams too much at limitations. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> A Shakespearean phrase came to mind, but I'm not going to say it. It, it. it 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 screams too much at the edges, and it doesn't know what to do there. It's stuck. It's like the empiricism and the epistemology, the ways of knowing of modernity, suddenly stop at the wound and doesn't know how to proceed. It stops at the crack. I feel, and the story we're telling with the book we're writing is the story of the Afro scene. Right, and th there's a there's some conceptual journey to be taken um, from the Anthropocene to the African Anthropocene to the Afrocene. The Afrocene is not the African Anthropocene. It's a way of seeing through blackness, not identitarian blackness, but seeing through blackness the histories of capture, the histories of oppression, the histories of loss and yearning and grieving. Seen through that vulnerable position, um, the world and its storing complex and its becoming and its materiality in beautiful ways. So it's wow. kind of like an, a tracing of stories, folklore, um, archetypes that invites us to do something else that may not look like activism, contemporary activism, but I think is desperately needed in these times some kind of sensorial politics is needed uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. and when you say it doesn't that's very interesting when you say it's it doesn't look like activism you speak sometimes about post activism yes can you can you tell me and us a little bit more about it um i have a um i have so I haven't gotten a diagnosis yet, but my wife, the closest, my closest companions, the people I work with, and even other psychologists and philosophers and clinical uh, clinicians tell me that they think that I'm 
on the autistic spectrum <laughs> that I'm <laughs> mildly autistic. Uh, and that may say a bit about my son as well. Um, one way that I kind of sense this might be true is the way that I interact with the public. Um, I have a fear of gum, chewing gum, right? I have a morbid, horrible distaste <laughs> for the thing. It's evil to me. Like, <laughs> like I would, <laughs> uh, I hate it. It's horrifying to me. I cannot stand the look of it. And yet, when I'm moving in public, and I say this especially now because I'm now in Hamburg, and Hamburg has a lot of gum on the, on its pavements. On its That's pavements. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not only Hamburg. It's Europe. It's yeah. everywhere. It's they're everywhere, and they're like beasts to me. They're like uh, beasts would be an, uh, would be a pathologization of beasts. I apologize to beasts. Gum is horrifying to me the toxic colors and everything the stickiness of it and I've always been haunted by it bullies bullied me in school you know would stick gum on my shoe and I'll leave the shoe where it was and hop to my home I wrote a newsletter around this some time ago <laughs> I say this because if you were to walk with me in Hamburg brother you would probably feel very embarrassed with the way I walk so, so I, I do this I do this. <laughs> <laughs> I like how your head wobbly almost. I do this <laughs> penguin or spider or crab like yeah. thing. And the only people that know how to walk with me are my daughter and son and my wife. They understand and they can hold me, but I really don't know how to, I have to look down to avoid it. I don't sight see, I don't look up into the sky. I don't admire stuff. I just want to get from point A to point B where there's gum. Uh-huh. And so, so this my walk feels like post activism, <laughs> uh <-huh>. right? <laughs> post activism is a way of navigating different thresholds in the public that may not be available for the citizen to notice, right? To uh -huh. the public is is not just uh, this flat place where things happen, a background to human sociality. The public is an imperative. The public is an intensity of field. It enlists bodies. It tells us when to stop, when to go. You know, there are lines on the ground. Those uh, are thresholds. It moves us. It shapes us, right? We don't just move in public. We are the public exploring itself, right? right. And yet, yeah. you know, what this does is that it hides um, a different kind of public. So there are different publics. There's a haunting of the public, which feels like uh -huh. the mainstream, right? For me, I know the haunted or the haunting public. It's gum. And this is why I walk as if there are ghosts around me, right? Uh, Post-activism yeah. is that, right? The world mm -hmm. is not flat. Modernity presumes that the world is flat. That all we need to do to take power away from those that oppress us with it is to challenge the powers that be, is to speak truth to power, is to rise up and resist with a black fist sometimes the powers that oppress us. But you see, the world is so promiscuous that sometimes doing that reconfirms and reinforces the um, things we're trying to evade and escape, right? I say it this way, that the way we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis, right? So it means we're in a different terrain altogether, and we have to cultivate ways of navigating hidden and invisible thresholds. This is what I mean by the paraterranean, sidling intelligence is walking like a crab. It's like, what are the modes of responding with crisis that is not a repudiation or a resolution or a cancellation of that crisis, but it's an invitation to develop new intelligences, right? to become keener, to shapeshift, like Mexicans um, invented Huitlacoche, right? I love this example of taking this fungal entity, this disease wow. that, inf that infects corn and making it a meal. That's not a resolution. That's not a solution. It's yeah. still there. It's still a disease. And yet they shapeshifted. Their guts shapeshifted. 
So post-activism is the intelligence of the Afro scene. It's an invitation to navigate the world differently. It's it's Guattari, Felix Guattari, the psychologist saying, bring something incomprehensible into the world. That is post-activism. Yeah. Mm. In a amazing, document. amazing. Wow, what a, wow, amazing. Can can you speak a little bit to what you said, the, the response to the crisis is part of the, crisis. Part of the crisis? Yeah. Can you can you speak a little bit more for us? Because that's, that's a very powerful. I feel it's a very important. So um, my um, just a few days ago, the Nigerian people re-elected a horrible assemblage of people as their leaders. Um, I'm not one for villainizing, but it's really difficult now. People are suffering where I come from. They don't have health care. They don't have any of those things that we might aspire to, right? Living and gestating in the city. And that's because um, we don't really have, we have proto nation states in, I think, right? And I, I think the kind of politics we need today transcends the nation state, but it needs to be said that we have bully systems, right? Instead of a nation state. <laughs> um, and these bully systems are, put in place to um, render everyone else that is not part of the political elite a prosthetic to their imperatives for aggrandizement, for wealth generation. And they do it all the time. They've accumulated billions and billions of dollars. They can buy the Supreme Court. They can buy the umpires for elections. They can buy their opponents. It's horrifying what they're able to do and what they subject other people to as a result of their, their poisonous wealth. Um, and yet they keep coming back. It's uh -huh. a complex system, but it needs to be asked, why do we keep reinforcing and re-electing the very oppressive powers that we know we know that they are, we know that they're horrible for us. What keeps us electing them? Yeah. Why do they keep coming back to power? Deleuze and Guattari had the same um, question about why fascism, why we bring fascism back into place over and over again. There's this beautiful movie about Hitler returning. And I forget the name of it. I think it's I'm Back or something like that. It's comedy, it's satire. But it ends with Hitler telling the protagonist that the German people elected me. You cannot get rid of me. And it becomes this kind of archetypal thing, right? Within a scene, at least. I'm not uh -huh. going to spoil the whole thing because it's a, it's, a, it's a powerful movie. And Why do people keep doing that? Why do we keep doing that? And I feel it's using the terms that Deleuze and Guattari might be fascinated by. It's desire. They thought of desire not as lack you know, through the psychoanalytic perspective, but as this more than human relations that keeps us in some kind of tautological economy. So we keep using the same terms. We keep doing the same things. The architecture around us instigates the same motivations, the same desires. And so we keep up, you know, we're stuck. It's a stuckness, right? So it's within this space that trauma makes sense, right? I, I, trauma begins to make sense within this stuckness. We keep coming back again and again. Time, sense. I love what trauma, at least not the, well, some concepts of trauma that I'm working with would disturb even time itself. At least trauma tells us at some level that time doesn't travel straightforwardly. Exactly. Past, present, future. Uh, well. it, time is slushy. Time can, can travel on a highway as if it's going straight and then stop and then be in the pit and then keep circling itself and not going yeah. anywhere in yeah. puddles for generations. And this is how our bodies tell us that the past is yet to come, that the past is not done with, exactly. right? <laughs> right? Yeah. That the thing you thought you've gotten rid of, no, you're still there, right? Yeah. So that is, that is, that is why 
post activism feels like also um, a schizo a schizoanalytic or ab therapeutic practice. It's an invitation for us to notice that we are held by forces beyond us. It's not. It doesn't come down to choice or consent. Exactly. Right? Like it's my choice. That's a modern myth that we are in charge of ourselves. I think microbes and trees and textures and archetypes and colors and buildings are participating in what it means to be us. And so post-activism says we need to meet the prosthetics. We need to touch the conditions of our becoming if we are to shapeshift or else we will keep on being there. That's fascinating. I love it so much. You speak so much from my heart and what you just said. That's so great. Also, the part with the with the space time, how trauma shapes space time. This is yeah. very, powerful. very yeah. powerful. Yeah, yeah, and also I love this much more expanded, like how you expand the the kind of myth of individualism and, and yes. open it up to a much wider frame that's so healthy and it feels like suddenly you can breathe. Yeah. Yes. I think so, yes. so many so many processes are projected onto that individualism. Indeed, that, uh, indeed, brother. That's very, very powerful. Wow. And you summarized it so beautifully. And that's that's also when when I sometimes speak about, because I would love to, so many questions come to me, um, like about the collective trauma field and, and that how unconscious these forces are in, in our societies. And, and I think exactly through what you said, how can yeah. we, we raise that up to our awareness that many yeah. things are not choices. The choices have been made somewhere, but we are not making them today. That I love that. So thank you for that. That's really great. Let's go back to something you said earlier. I, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing this now, but um, you said somehow that psychology is kind of the police of capitalism. I, I don't know if I uh, say this exactly as you said it, but I, I would love you to, to speak a bit to that. I think that's hmm. fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm not about to trace the history of um, psychology from its German, the dis psychological disciplinarity from its German roots um, uh, and its continental fascination with with the hard sciences and and how um, it moved from a speculative, you know, focus on on consciousness to a behaviorism to a cognitive focus. And then I think we're in the days of the neuro-reductionistic, you know, ideas where everything is reducible to neurons and brains, right. and right. especially with a return to a consideration of the body, which a lot needs to be said about that. Um, the New York Times just did a piece on the hyper psychologization is the word, of everything. You know, the, the trauma is the most popular term of the decade. It's like there is this intense focus on developmental psychology, on this, on the individual, the individual who needs to incessantly process and process and do shadow work and look okay. within and clear this one out and clear this other thing out. It it seems like it seems, and, and it's almost impossible for me with my dabbling in Marxism <laughs> to, to fail to notice the connections between, um, you know, psychology and politics, right? It's, they're not apart. Psychology is a kind of politics, right? But beyond saying this, it, it needs to be said that Psychology doesn't so much study. I mean, psychology 101 is that it's the science of human behavior, right? But it doesn't so much study an objective human behavior as if it were already there, waiting for it to just cast its lens and study it. It creates its subject of study through uh -huh. its methodologies, through its assumptions about what it means to be an individual. It creates this. And so there is um, 
and examples are not coming to mind, but I think I, eventually I could come up with some good examples to demonstrate historically how psychology is complicit or quite implied in how societies have shaped themselves. So in a very real sense, psychology polices the edges. To a large extent, psychoanalysis, for instance, and many modalities in therapy is about it's about this Procrustean, you, you know, the myth of Procrustes, you know, the, no, the Greek, the Greek uh, story. I think it's told by Homer uh, or Hesiod. I think it's Homer. Um, this, the story of Procrustes is this highway robber, a bandit, who would meet you on the highway and invite you to his home and give you a bed, basically, the epitome of hospitality, give you a bed. The thing is, the bed is a trap. And so once you lay in the bed, Procrustes would measure you. This measurement is critical to how psychology interacts with what we rudely call the individual, what I think should be considered a network instead of an individual or rhizomatic field instead of the atom. So Procrustes measures out. And if you exceed the bed, you are tall. You're taller than me. Last time we met in California, <laughs> Uh, I was looking up like that. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So you were tall. If you slept in Procrustes' bed, um, your feet would probably exceed the bed. He yeah. would cut you down to side, to size. He would literally cut your limbs so that you fit. And me, short as I am, he would stretch me out until I fit. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it sounds violent and and horrifying and monstrous right and all the terms we can throw at it that signify evil but that's not the point the point is there is something about the disciplinarity of psychology and therapy that measures the individual even when it's doing its best to try to help people adapt there is something ableist and conformist and capitalist about the models that people are being fit into for the individual um, that that means that those practices forget the politics of the world around the geologies, the microbial activisms, the ancestral paths that have been taken, that we are not neat and tidy. The effort to make things neat and tidy and say you have a clean bill of health, go and sin no more, seems uh -huh. to be uh -huh. a policing a guarding of the cracks. And I, I don't think I could come up with a better definition of whiteness or white modernity than what my sister Erin Manning would say, that whiteness polices the cracks. In a sense, psychology polices the cracks. It places in the asylum anything that breaks out of its notion of sanity or well-being. And there is a sense in which the city is an asylum. Uh, wow, wow, very, very strong. Yeah, I think also... I think that's why, like, I'm also so passionate about expanding the term trauma, because, like, for me, a lot of that movement also sits in the kind of fragmentation that happens where we, I think, especially in modernity, got hypnotized with the individual, but actually so much more information. Also, when you look at the deeper mystical a view on on a on life so that the liquefaction of of the ancestral and the collective and and i think the the expansion of how we look at life lies in in these deeper places and enlarging the map and mm -hmm. uh, so I, I resonate with this that the individual is being guarded actually by it and there's such a hyper focus and and also that i i call this sometimes the interdependent medicine, that medicine being focused on an individual doesn't make so much sense. I mean, it makes relatively sense for a part of it, but there's so much that's left out. And mm -hmm. I think that's why it's very hard for us to even, even get a, a deeper understanding of some of the chronic things that we are constantly dealing with, like heavy mm -hmm. diseases that can't be really figured out on that level. It needs a much larger map. And so that's yeah. why when you speak, it feels very, very good to me. So thank you. Thank you, brother. I, thank you. I, 
I, I have another, like, so that was one thing that I was interested in. And then I, when you speak of politics, I would love to um, maybe apply your understanding how we might look at politics from a, from a different lens yes. to the current situation here in Israel. I don't know. And if, if you don't know, if, if that's too complex, you can tell me because maybe... Oh, no, no. Yeah. I'm in touch. Yeah, okay, good. So, like, because I think here is exactly, um, like, we see these massive cracks in the society. Yeah, like, we see a massive crack, crack between the secular and the, the, the religious community. We see there's so much immigration that happened from Africa, from all kinds yeah. of places, Europe, uh, Iraq. And so the, there is this confluence of ancestries that I think there wasn't, I mean, there, there was still some attention to this, but not enough on the level that I think it needs to be to, to, to look at that kind of confluence in a way so we, we can create a different community together that has a different quality. So it's very, there are lots of fragmentations. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love, given also the crisis, the political crisis now, the mass demonstrations, like all the trauma that happens in the West Bank and, and like, I think terrible events. I mean, it's not starting now, but I think now it's just way more obvious. Mm -hmm. um, if we applied like a different way of looking at the systemic thing, like this, the, the system that we are seeing. Yeah. Maybe you can speak a little bit to how how you see this, and maybe how a different lens on politics can be applied, or what would be needed to let that emerge, or however you want to approach that. It's it's actually the subject of the book that we're writing at the moment. It's cracks. What we mean by cracks, and and why cracks are at the heart of a new kind of politics, mm -hmm. right? So statutorily, no, that's not the word. That's very ungainly, um, popularly, popularly. Um, politics is conceived as, as the matter between individuals, right? It's very Newtonian. It's that the public is the sphere of individuals already defined individuals interacting with each other, right? And this is where politics emerges from, from their conversations, from their ideologies, from the things they say they will do, and all of that, and the worlds that spill from human sociality. I think that's a very impoverished notion of politics, right? Because if we depend on that conceptualization of politics, then in response to the surprising intelligence and agency of planet Earth. We don't know what to do. It's that it means it's left to geniuses to save the day, right? It it means all we can do is depend on on some ablest notion of genius or intelligence to crack open the um the the chalice of power and solutionism, and then we can you know, by and by find ourselves home. It, it, it's a it's a very, very enlightenment notion of politics that doesn't really do much other than recenter humans as if we are as if we are uninvolved, untouched by the world around us, as if we are pure, pure categories unto ourselves. But when we start to humbly acknowledge that we have never been pure, brother. We are imbricated, entangled. We are bodies tumbled into bodies, tumbled into bodies, tumbled into bodies. You might think, right. oh, I'm doing this podcast because I feel motivated to do this podcast. It might be that some thing, <laughs> maybe cordyceps, some fungal entity, some, no, not a fungal entity. I'm, I'm reading Hollywood into this, um, but some microbe, a proliferation of micro microbes in your gut are actually, you know, supplementing and instigating this desire to be on a podcast show. Just to say that we, the, the lines between us inside and them outside is blurred. 
and we have never been human. So politics has to change as well. I think of politics as this, there's a, there's a very com- complex story that, and, and there's no speaking to the point here, brother. That's the thing to notice. There's no nailing it down and saying, here it is. This is the reason why I deploy poetry and storytelling a lot, because the only way to speak about it is not to speak about it. It's to dance around it, right? Yeah. It's it's a, it's a crack cannot be spoken about. It cannot be represented. You can only dance around it and decorate it to the extent that it remains it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but when I speak about politics, I think of all the aesthetical and artistic and spiritual and moves, you know, all the moves we can make to stay with the trouble, to make sanctuary. By making sanctuary, I don't mean keeping ourselves safe. I mean to say that the world, the universe, or what I would call the indeterminiverse, brother, and that's, I know, very, very clunky, but it's my way of Noticing that the universe isn't singular, and I don't quite like multiverse or universe. I like the indeterminacy of things. I like that the world is open-ended, so I call it the indeterminiverse, right? Like there, there is a <laughs> sense in which it produces new things, and it does this by giving the monster. The monster is not a devilish figure down the road. The monster is the crossroads. The monster is a is a dense and intelligent turn in the pattern of things. It's it's when things don't go according to plan. It's when things refuse to be instrumental to our purposes. It's when things, you know, take a left turn, when we expect them to take a right. That's right. the monster, right? Um, the monster, I feel, is a troubling place of deep failure for modernity. And we're doing our very best to try to flatten monsters, to try to colonize them, to name them finally, to name them the enemy and get rid of them. A monster is climate chaos. Like we're doing our darndest to defeat climate change, to defeat it, right? Right. Not considering that we are imbricated with this thing that we are calling climate change, right? right. Whether you want to agree with the sciences or not, that there's something speculatively powerful about the specter of a monster down the street, and we're doing our best to defeat it. When I think monsters are the engines, the machines of the universe to invite us to lose our way. And the only way to do something different with the world is to lose our way, right? Uh, So how do we convene a politics that allows us to sit with novelty, right? So I'm reconceiving politics as the communal effort, and it may not even come down to community as homogeneity, but the effort to sit with trouble, to sit with monster, to decorate the crossroads. And there's a lot to be said about this, but I'm not sure I can do it all in a podcast. Show. <laughs> I, I guess we have to have another conversation to go into this. But that's, that's so amazing. I love it. And I, I love that you speak to the capacity like how can we stay and stay in in the crossroads that you are yes, in the monsters? Yes. Yeah. Like yes. that human capacity when things don't go right and we yes. we can stay in it. I yes. think that's such a fundamental human capacity. That's an amazing um, like to give oneself to that moment. You spoke to something I think super important. Yeah. How how would it like maybe a last thing? I know it's so very complex. We need to open a, 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 yeah, a space that is uh, that holds that well. But just if maybe a few sentences or thoughts about like when if we if politics if that is politics, what you said now, how how could that or how can we walk into that direction? Or maybe there is no direction to walk there. But like from where we are now to yeah. be able to come closer to that capacity? Yes. It's a fair question. The, the kind of things that I talk about are largely impersonal. Um, I'm not a scholar of the personal or the individual. I'm a scholar of the impersonal. 
I'm much more alive to terrains and territories and principalities and powers and horizons and fields and intensities and thresholds than I am alive to questions about what does it mean for me, which is not what you're right. asking. But I constantly right. get the question, so what do I do next? And right. sometimes the crack is not available for that, right? It's like, imagine you're... A damn tall train station is just down the street over here, um, here in Hamburg. Um, yeah. It's a very, you probably know. Yeah, it. I know it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just down the street. I can, I'm looking at it right now. Um, the, imagine our walking there. And in, in just before I cross over to the other side, there is a, a black hole emerges. A black hole, brother, a black hole. And, you know, a black hole emerges right there in the middle of the street. I don't know how that, I don't know about the math or the physics of that, but just play with me, right? And and that changes everything, doesn't it, right? A black hole in Germany, in Hamburg, would mean we have to stop everything else we're doing and consider this, (laughs) like, okay, there is a cosmic being that has visited us. Um, How we gravitate towards it is, is, not always available for contemplation prior to the event, right? We can only think about it in retrospect, right? There's no saying what you do or I do. There's no planning right. for that moment. It's the same way with cracks. It, it, you, you cannot prefigure approach to a God, right? It's, it's, right. You, you, you can't plan for that. It's, it's, and, and our, mythical and archetypal stories are replete with accounts of people who felt they knew how to approach a god or a goddess and ended up turned into a beast a deer or something like how dare you approach me that way right so so this is like a god descended it's or a god emerging from the ground a, a, a fungal god of some kind a wild god a crack is is a way the universe reminds us that we are not ourselves and we are we owe our becoming to things that exceed us, right? And this warps the question of what does it mean for me? Because me is no longer available. It, right. it, it, yeah. it, 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 but but there, it's still a deeply practical, it's a fair question. Like how do we come to a place? And this is what I'm trying to work out with others. Like, like there is a kind of practical politics I, I'm not able to say much to this because of the time. There is a kind of practical p- politics that might bring us to the edges, just to the edges, enough to be able to sit still with it. It comes from a place of vulnerability. Cracks have a psychological immediacy that I've not spoken to here. Cracks are not just uh, black holes in Hamburg. Cracks are the, the, the idea that we are haunted ourselves. I think it's enshrined in the Afro-Caribbean spiritualities that we are open and porous beings, that Thomas is not Thomas. Thomas might be a vessel for Charles or Chaka Khan or something, right? And that you're not yourself, right? Those are ways that I think about cracks, like disturbances in the field that invite us to take a new direction. Right. How we presence that moment, how we presence those those misdirections, th- those failures, might be the heart of a new kind of politics that we need today. Right. I'll just stop there for now. Yeah, maybe. So that's fascinating. So I, I you know, every time you speak, I have ten other questions or like <laughs> responses come up. It's so creative. It's so fantastic. And I, with many things, I'm, I'm very much in resonance with what you're saying. So it's great that you, that in your eloquence, yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank it's, you. It's beautiful. It's been fun. It's always great speaking with you, brother. Thank yeah, you. it's great speaking to you, but thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.